My husband Mike and I have now been happily married for five years, and our journey together spans nearly seven years in total. Our story began at a college party where I first noticed him. He seemed a bit uneasy, fidgeting in his seat and looking around as though he wished he were anywhere but there. I could sense his shyness and discomfort in the crowd, and something compelled me to approach him. To my surprise, our conversation flowed effortlessly, defying any awkwardness typically associated with meeting someone new. We ended up spending the remainder of that evening together, laughing and getting to know one another in a way that felt both effortless and sincere. About a month later, fate brought us together again at a Whole Foods store near our campus. Once more, I found myself drawn to him, and our discussion picked up as if no time had passed since that memorable party. As we chatted, I caught myself flirting, which was unexpected for me. Before meeting Mike, I had never seriously considered dating someone outside my own race, I'm white, and he's black. It wasn't that I thought people of other races weren't attractive, I simply hadn't had the chance to explore that before. Having attended a predominantly white school, my dating experiences had been limited to other white guys. When Mike realized that I wasn't going to let him off the hook in the store, he shyly suggested that I walk with him while he finished his shopping. It was a small but significant moment that felt promising. After we checked out, I summoned the courage to ask for his phone number. When I did, he looked genuinely surprised but eventually gave it to me. I was eager to ask him out right then, but I sensed that he was a bit caught off guard, so I decided to wait. Nonetheless, that night, I texted him, and thus began a delightful exchange where we called and texted each other regularly. As the days passed, Mike surprised me by calling to ask me out on a date. I eagerly said yes, but I could still sense a bit of hesitation in his voice. When our date finally arrived, it turned out to be nothing short of perfect. In my previous relationships, I had always experienced a quick progression towards closeness, but with Mike, everything felt different. After our second date, I tried to initiate some intimacy, but he respectfully declined. I felt a twinge of disappointment and decided to ask him why, as it was apparent that we had feelings for one another. Mike explained that he had only been in one other relationship before me, and while they had shared some intimacy, they had never gone all the way. He confessed that he had always intended to wait until marriage but had strayed from that plan with his first girlfriend. He conveyed that he wanted to reserve intimacy for someone with whom he had true feelings, and although I understood, his words stung a bit. I assured him that his preference wasn't a problem for me, my own experience was limited, but I had a good sense of my preferences. I suggested that we could explore and learn about both our boundaries and desires together. Seeing my hurt, Mike quickly reassured me that he did, in fact, have deep feelings for me. It was just a sharing of his thoughts rather than a rejection. We mutually agreed to take things slow. A few weeks later, I invited him to a gathering hosted by one of my friends. Despite his introverted nature and dislike for large crowds, he attended because I expressed how important it was for me that he got to know my friends. While most of my friends were friendly, I noticed some odd behaviors from a few of them around Mike. Eventually, one of my so-called close friends remarked loudly, Is this the guy you've been choosing over us? You could do much better. At that moment, it all clicked, I understood the reason behind the peculiar glances and whispers. I glanced at Mike and saw the pain etched on his face. I stood up for him and replied, no, he's the one who deserves better. I consider myself fortunate to have him. After that, we decided to leave the gathering. Later, a true friend confided in me that some of our mutual acquaintances had been whispering that I was too attractive for Mike. I genuinely couldn't believe it, it had never crossed my mind. To me, he was not only handsome but also someone I felt incredibly lucky to be with. I found myself calling my mom to vent about the whole situation, and she patiently listened as I expressed my frustration and disbelief over what had occurred. When I finished sharing, her supportive words helped to reaffirm why I valued my relationship with Mike so deeply. It became clear to me that we had something special, and I was determined to cherish it despite the misunderstandings that sometimes surfaced. She said, you're in love with him, honey. When are you going to introduce him to us? Her words hung in the air, and I immediately insisted that I couldn't possibly be in love with him yet. After all, at that point in time, we had only been getting to know each other for about three months, and we had been dating for nearly two. Still, my mother simply responded with a profound observation that one cannot control when love strikes. It seemed apparent to her that I had already fallen for him, much like I had for my father when I observed the deeply loving marriage my parents shared. Their relationship was something I had always longed for myself especially after witnessing the joy and happiness they radiated together. Feeling a mix of emotions and somewhat overwhelmed, I made my way to his apartment unannounced after our conversation. The urge to be close to him was strong, so I asked him to hold me tight. Eventually, 
he encouraged me to share what was bothering me. I opened up about everything that weighed on my mind, except for my mother's remarks about being in love. That word, the four-letter one, felt too heavy for me to utter at that moment. During our talk, he revealed something that struck a chord in me. He confessed that he had always thought I was out of his league and worried that I might leave him for someone more attractive. I had always been aware that others often considered me attractive, perhaps even more so than most. However, hearing him voice those insecurities shattered my heart. It hurt to see him doubt himself in such a way. I quickly reassured him that my feelings were genuine and that I did not want anyone else. Our conversation danced back and forth for a while, but eventually, I sensed that he accepted my reassurances as the truth. I desired him, and him alone. That night marked a significant milestone for us as it was our first intimate encounter. While there were moments of clumsiness due to his inexperience, I found it genuinely enjoyable, more so than any experiences I had with previous partners. It became clear to me in hindsight that the connection we shared was fueled by the love that was beginning to blossom between us. Later, as we lay cuddling together, he revisited the earlier discussion. He confided in me that one of his greatest fears was being cheated on. His worry about how others perceived our relationship only heightened that anxiety. Hearing him express these concerns ignited a spark of anger within me. I found myself questioning why people couldn't recognize the incredibly good person he was, opting instead to focus solely on his appearance and make assumptions. After countless conversations and my persistent reassurances, he genuinely began to embrace the truth, I wanted only him. Fast forward a couple of months, and we found ourselves visiting my parents. At the time, I was attending an out-of-state college, and this visit held immense significance for both of us. Until that moment, I had never introduced a boyfriend to my family, so my parents understood the gravity of the situation. To our surprise, he got along remarkably well with everyone. I had forewarned my parents that Mike was a bit shy, which meant they didn't overwhelm him with too much attention during the introductions. This may have played a role in the positive interactions that unfolded. It was heartwarming to witness my younger brother, who was just two years old at the time, become practically inseparable from Mike throughout our entire visit. Observing them play together, I could see that he would make an incredible father one day. In that tender moment, I uttered, I love you, for the first time, and it felt surreal. Fast forward two years, and we married after the birth of our first child. Mike's business required him to travel frequently, and he even suggested that his business partner handle most of the travel so he could stay home with us. I assured him that we would be okay with his occasional absences of two to four days. One evening, during one of his trips, I was hanging out with my friend Rachel when a new acquaintance of hers joined us. It turned out this individual was a recent friend of Rachel's. Initially, our interaction went smoothly, but things took a turn when she began probing about my marriage. She asked if I was happy and whether he still treated me the same way he had before. At first, I didn't think much of their questions. I assumed they were simply curious about married life since neither of them was married. I replied honestly, stating that I was indeed very happy and that he treated me just as well as he had before we tied the knot. However, the tone shifted as they began to suggest that perhaps I wasn't as happy as I claimed to be. Usually, when someone criticized my relationship, I reacted defensively. But this time was different, I decided to ask them why they felt that way. They claimed that Mike had essentially abandoned me after our daughter was born. I couldn't help but reflect on their words. As I had mentioned earlier, he offered to let his business partner handle the majority of the travel to be home more often. I recognized how crucial these business trips were for him, understanding their importance not just for his career but for his personal growth as well. Despite my feelings of resentment about his absence, I chose to encourage him to go on those trips. They were always brief, but the distance sometimes led me to wonder if his feelings for me had changed. A nagging doubt crept in that perhaps he saw these excursions as an opportunity to escape from our life together. Deep down, I knew that this belief was unfounded, yet I still couldn't shake off the flicker of insecurity that lingered in the back of my mind. Juggling the demands of caring for our baby girl while also managing household chores often left me feeling overwhelmed. After discussing our situation, Mike and I came to an agreement that hiring a maid service for weekly cleaning would alleviate some of my burdens, and we decided to bring in a live-in nanny to help during those especially hectic days. During this time, I spent more moments with friends, and their opinions about relationships echoed in my mind, amplifying my feelings of inadequacy. Even though Mike was doing everything a good husband should do, something felt off, as if an invisible thread was pulling us further apart. One day, I absentmindedly forgot to wear my wedding ring when I went out to dinner with some friends, and to my surprise, I caught the attention of a guy at the restaurant. A part of me thought that a little harmless flirting couldn't hurt, so I joined him at the bar. 
Our drinks flowed more freely than usual, even though neither Mike nor I were known for being heavy drinkers. While nothing intimate occurred that night, I did end up giving him my number. As Mike's work schedule became increasingly demanding, our conversations dwindled. A few days later, when the guy from the restaurant called me to ask for a date, I inexplicably said yes. The night unfolded, and despite my initial reservations, I found myself slipping into a situation that took a turn I had never anticipated. About ten minutes into it, the gravity and wrongness of what I was doing crashed down on me, and in a sudden moment of clarity, I stopped everything. I told him that I was married to a man I loved deeply and that our actions were fundamentally wrong, and I needed to leave right away. I kept that dreadful day a secret from everyone, and when Mike returned home, I poured my heart back into our marriage, vowing to remain faithful. Fast forward to this morning, Mike woke me at 6 a.m., explaining that he needed to meet someone. I didn't think twice about it and casually asked if I should make breakfast for him when he got back. He declined the offer, uncertain of how long he would be gone. After a quick kiss, he encouraged me to go back to sleep, which I complied with, a decision I would soon question. Little did I realize that the meeting he attended would be the catalyst for an event that would alter the course of our lives. Mike didn't return until late afternoon, around 5 o'clock. Earlier in the day, when I called him, he mentioned he had ended up at his mom's house and assured me he would be back soon. Yet, when he finally walked through the door, I didn't hear him arrive until after 6 o'clock. He could have entered through either the front door or the garage, but I hadn't noticed either one opening. I called out to him, and he told me he was in our room. As I entered, I was struck by the sight of him, his face was stained with tears, and he recoiled from my touch, a reaction I had never witnessed before. Before I had a chance to voice my concern, he looked me dead in the eyes and asked, Did our vows mean nothing to you? The weight of his words hit me like a freight train, and I instantly understood what he was referring to. The pain etched on his face shattered my heart into pieces, I couldn't find my voice. He continued, Don't insult my intelligence by lying to my face. In that moment, I felt a surge of urgency and knew I had to share the truth with him. Tears streamed down my cheeks as I shared every painful detail, the guilt flooding out as I pleaded for him not to leave me. He reminded me of his no second chances rule for cheaters, and at that moment, my tears turned into frantic sobs. I had completely forgotten my mother was nearby until she appeared at the bedroom door, inquiring if everything was okay. I assured her that all was well, and she eventually left, giving me space to focus on Mike. In a tense moment, he handed me his phone, instructing me to press play. To my horror, I discovered that the man I had cheated with had secretly recorded our encounter. The footage confirmed my account of stopping before anything happened, but it was an image that would haunt me forever, the woman I loved in such an intimate moment with another man. As I tried to explain how I hadn't strayed since that incident and how it meant nothing, he countered my claims by pointing out how long ago it had taken place, leaving me to confront the stark reality of my actions. My heart sank, knowing I had a long road ahead if I were to mend the rift I had created in our marriage. The situation was incredibly complicated, and the emotional upheaval was palpable. It didn't matter that my lips had brushed against another man's in a moment of misguided temptation, especially while he was right there, the lingering betrayal was all-consuming. I could hardly fathom how he would feel if the roles were reversed and I had sought comfort in another woman's arms. The heartache echoed in my reply, where I admitted that the very thought of it broke me. I had never felt the urge to look for affection elsewhere, even during the tough times when he seemed distant and detached. My belief was strong, I thought that if we both committed to working through our issues, I could win back the love of my life, my wife. Yet, everything I had hoped for crumbled as I realized his feelings were overshadowed by guilt. No, that's not it, he insisted, trying to convey the depth of his love for me. I can't grasp how you could love me so intensely and still engage in such an act. My heart ached at his words. I could feel the weight of the situation pressing down on us as I replied, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to make things right. Perhaps we should consider couples therapy to help us through this. His response was one I dreaded, or I want a divorce. I can't bear the thought of prolonging this agony when I know I'll never erase that image from my mind. The anger I wanted to feel toward him was overshadowed by a deep-seated love that still lingered. Despite everything, I found myself pleading with him to reconsider, to give us another chance. Not long after he had left the room, my mother walked in. I hesitated to tell her about my transgression, but I desperately needed her wisdom. The disappointment etched across her face was hard to bear, but then she shared something I had no knowledge of, my father had cheated on her twice. It was a shocking revelation. I remembered the rough patches in their marriage but never understood how they managed to stay together. When I asked her how they worked through it, she mentioned couples therapy and my father's relentless commitment to fixing their relationship. 
She then asked if I had told my husband about the pregnancy. In truth, that thought had completely slipped my mind amidst my panic about potentially losing him. My focus had been so singular that I hadn't even considered the implications. My mother advised me to share this news with him, yet a wave of worry washed over me. I feared he would think I was trying to manipulate him into staying with me, that I was using this revelation as some sort of bargaining chip. The truth was that I had known about the pregnancy for only a few days, and my motives were not tied to coercion in any way, I simply regretted my actions deeply. My heart was heavy with the question of what steps I should take to make amends. I reflected on everything that had transpired, and then a new thought crossed my mind. Here I was, wrapped up in this emotional turmoil, and yet I had a story of my own to share. I'm a 32-year-old man who has been married to my wife for just over a year. While that may seem like a short time in the grand scheme of things, it's been filled with its own unique experiences. For privacy's sake, let's refer to my wife as Renee. She is a 28-year-old woman with dreams that stretch far and wide. Our paths first crossed about three years ago when she moved to the city, filled with ambition and hope, eager to carve out a career in fashion design. Her dream was to make it big in Hollywood, but her parents had their reservations, worried about the industry's reputation. They wanted her to step into the family business instead. Undeterred, Renee made the bold choice to relocate to California, where she began an internship at a fashion company. My career in advertising often meant collaboration with fashion firms, which is how I first met her. Despite being new to her role, her manager quickly recognized her exceptional talent and began to involve her in high-profile briefings. As time passed, she became the key liaison between our companies, and our professional interactions eventually blossomed into something more personal. What began as boardroom meetings transitioned into romantic dinners and sweet moments together. I admired Renee's unwavering drive and tenacity, she stood defiantly against her family's expectations, facing the risk of being disowned just to follow her dreams. At that point, we had to keep our relationship under wraps due to her company's strict policy against dating clients. About six months into her internship, she landed a more lucrative full-time role at a different company. This change allowed us to redefine our boundaries, separating our professional lives from our personal relationship became crucial to maintaining our careers. Moving in together solidified our commitment, and we officially became a couple. Renee's social circle was limited, aside from her colleagues, past and present, she didn't have many friends in the city. As a result, she often found herself mingling with my group of friends. With her friendly demeanor, sharp intellect, and infectious sense of humor, she quickly became a beloved member of our circle. The bond we formed during this time was genuine and filled with the promise of a bright future together. As I looked back on our journey, I couldn't help but feel a mix of nostalgia and uncertainty about where everything was headed. I found immense joy in spending time with Renee, to the point where I never questioned the strength of our relationship. After two wonderful years of dating, I felt ready to take the next step and propose to her. To my delight, she accepted my proposal with enthusiasm. However, beneath that joy, there were concerns brewing regarding her family's approval. Renee came from a conservative Christian background, while I did not identify with any religious beliefs, and she worried that her parents would not support our union. This concern was compounded by the fact that her parents had already expressed disapproval of her career choice, fearing it did not align with their values. In an effort to ease her apprehensions and bridge the gap between our families, I suggested that she meet my parents first. I hoped that their warmth and acceptance would provide some reassurance. To my relief, my parents immediately took a liking to her, appreciating her personality and warmth. I made a promise to Renee that I would do my utmost to convince her parents of our commitment to each other. Despite my offer of support, she insisted that she preferred to handle the situation with her parents on her own. My parents had proposed the idea of a joint dinner that would bring both families together, but Renee felt it was best for her parents to come directly to the wedding instead. I respected her decision, recognizing that she understood her family dynamics better than anyone else, even though my mother found this approach somewhat unusual. I assured her that everything would turn out fine as we prepared for the wedding. As the big day approached, I took the initiative to ask Renee whether she wanted to honor her family's traditional customs during the ceremony. However, she expressed a clear preference for doing things in a way that reflected our unique relationship, which I wholeheartedly supported. When the wedding day arrived, I found myself mentally preparing for what I expected to be difficult conversations with her parents. Much to my surprise, they turned out to be kind and welcoming, far removed from the conservative and judgmental individuals I had imagined. They were polite and gentle with everyone, which pleasantly surprised my mother and made her feel more at ease. I commended Renee for her skillful handling of her parents concerning our wedding, but she preferred not to dwell on it and suggested we discuss it further after the festivities. 
Once the wedding was behind us, I broached the subject of visiting her hometown. I knew she had not returned to see her parents since starting her career, and I wondered if she would be open to the idea. She mentioned her busy work schedule, stating that she would plan a visit when her workload lightened. About five months after our wedding, I was scheduled to go to Tokyo for work. Initially, my trip was planned for four days, but it eventually extended to a full week for leisure. Renee was aware of my travel plans from the start. However, on the day I was set to leave, she made an unexpected decision to fly to visit her parents instead. She wanted to avoid being alone while I was away. I found this sudden change in her plans puzzling. I had hoped to accompany her, but given that I would be gone for a week, I felt it was inappropriate to voice my desire. During those five days apart, a sense of distance seemed to grow between us. I was preoccupied with work and exploring Tokyo, while I assumed she was busy reconnecting with her family after such a long time apart. When we both returned home, I expressed my interest in meeting her family again, particularly her parents, whom I had only briefly met at the wedding. She suggested we could plan a meeting for another time, a few weeks after her trip. A little while later, Renee approached me with something important she wanted to discuss, and to my surprise, it revolved around her brother. This was a revelation, as she had never mentioned her brother during our time together. Previously, she had mentioned having a sibling but noted that they weren't close, so it caught me off guard when she brought him up. I recalled asking about her brother's absence at our wedding, to which she had casually mentioned their distant relationship, hinting that he might be busy with the family business while their father was away. As she opened up, Renee explained that her brother was not straight, and when their conservative family discovered his sexual orientation, they subjected him to therapy in an attempt to change him. This made me raise an eyebrow. She elaborated on their small town upbringing, explaining that in her community, homosexuality was still viewed as a mental illness, and her parents held steadfast to their conservative beliefs. Despite enduring years of therapy, her brother remained true to himself, leading their parents to disown him eventually. This tragic turn of events was part of the reason why they wished for Renee to take over the family business. Renee shared that her brother had struggled with the rejection from their family, which ultimately led him to substance misuse and a need for rehabilitation. This was why he was absent from our wedding festivities. I couldn't help but feel disappointed that she hadn't confided in me about her brother's situation earlier, particularly since it clearly affected such significant aspects of her life and family. Renee hadn't shared this information with me earlier, and during her recent visit to her hometown, she finally opened up to the emotional turmoil she was experiencing. With tears in her eyes, she explained that she had been apprehensive about how I would react to her family's background. It had been a challenging visit for her, and it was during this trip that she learned some troubling news about her brother, Marco. He had recently completed rehab but was now living alone, having been abandoned by their family. This situation filled Renee with worry, as she feared that Marco might relapse due to the overwhelming frustration and loneliness he was likely experiencing. Concerned for his well-being, she asked if he could temporarily stay with us in California until he managed to find a job and secure his own place. Considering we had a spare room in our apartment, which was mostly filled with packages and items we no longer needed, I reluctantly agreed to this arrangement. A few weeks later, Marco arrived, and it became clear that he was a year younger than Renee and had always relied on her protective nature. From the moment I met him, I sensed that he was a reserved individual. His demeanor suggested that his self-confidence had taken a hit due to his troubled past, and he didn't engage in much conversation with me. Whenever I was home, I noticed he would either retreat to his room or venture outside, avoiding interaction as much as possible. Now, over two months have passed since Marco moved in, and I've seen Renee using her connections to help him secure employment. On several occasions, I've noticed him dressing up and leaving for interviews, but sadly, he hasn't had any success yet. While I don't want to appear callous or uncaring, I must admit I'm starting to feel uncomfortable with his presence in our home. What troubles me even more is how much Renee has changed since Marco's arrival. She now seems to take on more of a sisterly role, focusing all her energy on him, leaving me feeling like a secondary character in our own lives. Initially, I thought her concern was simply her being supportive, but the shift in our relationship has begun to bother me profoundly. Adding to my unease, I've noticed some behaviors from Marco that raise my suspicions. There's a part of me that worries he might still be caught up in substance use or hiding something more significant from us. Recently, I suggested to Renee that we plan a trip to her hometown together, thinking it might help her recharge, but she brushed me off, claiming she was too busy this month. Additionally, she made a request that I found puzzling. She asked me not to inform her parents about Marco living with us. When I probed her about her reasoning, she explained that since her parents had disowned him, they wouldn't appreciate my decision to support him. Her reasoning felt confusing to me 
especially since she mentioned they had finally come to accept her career and were pleased with her life choices. She didn't want to jeopardize their improved relationship by bringing up the topic of Marco. This whole situation began to raise red flags in my mind. I noticed that both Marco and Renee had become rather secretive lately, often switching the subject whenever I walked into the living room or kitchen. I even caught them whispering to each other, and when I entered the room, they would abruptly change their conversation as if they were discussing something they didn't want me involved in. When I confronted Renee about this behavior, she casually explained that they were discussing Marco's relapse struggles and his therapy sessions, which he felt embarrassed to talk about in my presence. Recently, I confided in a colleague about my concerns, and he suggested that my discomfort might stem from jealousy, considering that Renee's attention seemed divided. This thought made me hesitant to open up to others or confront Renee directly about my feelings. In a follow-up update, I want to express my gratitude for the advice I received from my previous post. Some individuals shared unsettling stories about other men whose wives had cheated on them while disguising their lovers as brothers, which was a shocking revelation for me. It was something I could never have imagined in this situation. Instead of jumping to conclusions, I decided it would be wise to investigate further. I began my investigation by checking Marco's identification, a step I now wish I had taken much earlier. A few days after my initial post, I stumbled upon a moment that felt pivotal. I unexpectedly walked into the living room where Rene and Marco were seated together. To break the ice, I asked Marco about his job interviews, which was a departure from my usual avoidance of their personal matters. He seemed caught off guard by my question and stuttered when replying, claiming he was in discussions with several recruiters, though nothing had materialized yet. I seized the opportunity to mention that a friend of mine was looking for a reliable supervisor for his office and expressed my desire to refer Marco for the role, hoping to ignite a spark of motivation in him. Typically, when someone is on the job hunt, they would react with joy and enthusiasm upon receiving favorable news about a potential opportunity. However, in this instance, the reaction was far from what one might expect, there was an overwhelming sense of shock that overshadowed any excitement. Without allowing much time for contemplation, I immediately requested Marco's resume. Just as I was about to press further, Renee interrupted, stating that she would provide the resume later. Yet, I felt compelled to insist on having it right away. Renee's resistance only deepened my suspicions about the situation. After a brief exchange filled with tension, Marco, albeit reluctantly, agreed to share a digital copy of his resume. In their presence, I swiftly opened the file to check for his name. My instincts whispered caution, and my doubts were soon confirmed. While he maintained the first name Marco, his surname was not the same as Renee's maiden name. This discrepancy prompted me to subtly inquire about the reason behind it. However, before Marco could articulate a response, Renee interjected, claiming that he had changed his surname after being disowned by their parents. I had anticipated such an explanation but found myself increasingly suspicious. Up to that point, I had feared that this brother-sister duo was concealing something significant, but this revelation only muddied the waters further, leaving me questioning their true relationship. Fast forward about a week later, I casually mentioned to Renee that I had a work-related trip planned near her hometown. I suggested that she might consider joining me for a visit to her parents' house if she was available. I intentionally kept the notice short, making it easier for her to decline, a strategy one had anticipated would work, and as expected, she quickly responded that she was busy. Yet, her continued inquiries about whether I planned to visit her parents piqued my curiosity even more. I assured her that I would not make the trip alone and that we could arrange something at a later date. In reality, I had no such work trip on the horizon. My true motive was to venture to her hometown and meet her parents to uncover the truth behind their relationship. I won't go into details about how I obtained their address, but it was accessible through her ID. Upon arriving at their house, I immediately informed her parents that I wished to keep my visit a surprise from Renee, as I was planning something special for her upcoming birthday, which was just a couple of days away. They welcomed me warmly, eager to hear more about the surprise. During our conversation, I gradually steered the topic towards conservatism, mentioning how Renee had described them in such a manner. They chuckled, thinking I was joking, which only drew me in further. I then initiated a conversation about their religious beliefs, only to discover that they were not conservative at all. As I navigated the conversation, I subtly inquired about their business without raising any suspicions. Her father mentioned that he planned to retire from his company the following year, looking forward to a more relaxed lifestyle. Seizing the opportunity, I asked how the business would operate after his retirement. He explained that his son was already managing the business effectively, making him the logical heir. At that moment, I noticed that Renee's mother appeared uneasy, prompting me to shift the conversation. 
Yet, her father continued, expressing the importance of fairness between both his children. He explained that he had encouraged René to join the family business, ensuring that both of his children would share equally in its success. As he detailed his efforts to ensure fairness, he mentioned that his son, Ryan, was from his first marriage. Hearing the name Ryan sent a shiver down my spine, forcing me to pause and catch my breath. I quickly interrupted him, suggesting that we could discuss our differences further when they attended Renee's birthday celebration. Although I didn't get the chance to meet Ryan that day, I noticed his presence in the family photos adorning their hallway. As I prepared to leave, I took one last opportunity to emphasize the importance of keeping my visit a secret from Renee, which they readily agreed to. A sense of revulsion washed over me as I processed the unsettling truth. Renee had indeed been having an affair, all while presenting him as her brother. I visited her parents on a Saturday, nearly a week before her birthday, and the unease I felt sharing a home with her was palpable. So much so, I resolved not to return home after that encounter. When she called me on Sunday, her inquiry about when I would come home only deepened my discomfort. My work had unexpectedly extended, leading to a situation where I would not be returning home until Thursday morning. In the meantime, I found myself staying in a hotel. I was acutely aware that during my absence, Renee and her lover were likely enjoying their time together. However, I felt no concern over this. My main focus was on exposing Renee and confronting her directly in front of her parents. To prepare for this, I had already taken proactive steps by initiating discussions with a lawyer to begin the divorce process. In fact, just a few hours prior to posting this update, I had a meeting scheduled with my attorney to discuss the details and next steps. I planned to provide another update once I had confronted her and revealed the truth about the situation. Update 2, I have finalized my divorce, and I want to apologize for the delay in sharing this news. I felt it was important to wrap up everything first so I could present it all at once. Some readers pointed out that I had overlooked obvious signs throughout this ordeal, but the reality is, when those events were unfolding, they didn't strike me as odd. It was only in hindsight, particularly following the arrival of Marco, that everything started to fall into place. Each individual incident didn't truly seem suspicious on its own, but once you look at the bigger picture, it becomes glaringly evident. I faced a bit of teasing from some for not catching on sooner. Moving on, I had invited Renee's parents to join us for her birthday celebration on Thursday. I returned home that very same day, and Renee was there. Seeing her face filled me with a deep sense of discomfort, so much so that I didn't even offer her a birthday wish. She seemed to believe I had forgotten about her special day entirely. In a playful manner, she hugged me and asked for a birthday greeting. I decided to play along and wished her a happy birthday, even though internally I was conflicted. She suggested that we should go out to celebrate, but I claimed to be too tired and in desperate need of a shower. After my shower, I noticed that Renee had already dressed up and was visibly excited about going out. I played it cool and pretended not to notice her eagerness, opting instead to retreat to bed. Renee, embracing her cute and flirtatious side, insisted that I get ready to take her out. I feigned indifference and mentioned that I had a terrible headache and needed to take a nap. I told her I just needed a couple of hours, which visibly upset her. Nevertheless, I reassured her that it would be worth the wait. In all honesty, I wasn't feeling drowsy. Instead, my heart was heavy, knowing that the time for confrontation was approaching. About an hour later, I received a call from Renee's father, letting me know they were on their way. I got out of bed quickly and headed outside. On my way, I caught sight of Renee and Marco chatting and cooking in the kitchen. Renee even asked me where I was rushing off to, and I casually replied that I needed to collect a package outside. Once outside, I waited a few minutes until I saw them arrive. I greeted Renee's parents and ushered them inside, and in that moment, the atmosphere was laden with shock and despair, not just for Renee and Marco, but also for her parents. It quickly became clear that they were already aware of Marco's presence in our home. Renee turned to me seeking some sort of explanation for what was happening. I responded with a casual remark, suggesting it would have been easier if Ryan had shown up. Her father then shot Renee a disgusted look and began questioning her about Marco being in our house. At this point, Renee started sobbing, and I couldn't help but sarcastically continue my line of questioning, asking why she was acting surprised when Marco was supposed to be her son. Renee, visibly distressed, pleaded with me to stop. Meanwhile, Marco appeared ready to leave, but I placed my hand on his shoulder, kindly instructing him to stay seated. Her mother demanded to know the truth, compelling me to lay everything bare. As I recounted the events, both Marco and Renee sat frozen in shock. Her parents looked at them with disdain before turning their attention back to me, asking if I had known about this all along. 
I shook my head and replied that I had only just learned the truth during my visit with them. It was then that her father revealed additional information that had not been disclosed to me before. He explained that Marco had previously been Renee's college boyfriend and had a long-standing battle with pill addiction, which had placed him in a position of dependency on Renee's financial support. This led her parents to stop giving her money, hoping instead that she would take a more active role in the family business to manage her finances. Instead, Renee made the choice to support her boyfriend, ultimately leaving home, finding a job, and moving to California. After we moved to California, a new chapter began in our lives. Our wedding was a moment of joy, especially for Renee's parents, who expressed their happiness upon learning of her marriage to me. They believed that she had finally moved on from her past relationship with Marco. However, the situation took a dramatic turn when I found her sitting with Marco in our home, sending my mind into a whirlwind of confusion and doubt. I turned to Renee, seeking answers, and questioned whether her connection with Marco had reignited during her visit to her parents while I was away on my trip to Tokyo. She met my gaze, her expression serious, and after a moment of silence, she confessed the uncomfortable truth. Renee admitted that she had intentionally kept me away from her family, fearing that her history with Marco would be uncovered. She insisted that she had genuinely moved on from him, yet the revelation of Marco's return from rehab had proven too tempting for her to resist. In their meeting, Marco had managed to convince her of his transformation and had encouraged her to consider divorcing me. Renee, though hesitant to take that drastic step immediately, agreed to devise a plan with Marco. It was true that she and her stepbrother Ryan had a strained relationship, so she saw this as an opportunity to introduce Marco to me as her brother. Even as the tension escalated, Marco expressed his disdain for the plan, particularly for staying in my house. However, Renee exerted her influence, pushing him to comply. The situation deteriorated further when her father, upon discovering the extent of Renee's deception, confronted Marco. He was deeply hurt by how Renee had cast him and her mother in a negative light just to maintain her relationship with Marco. Emotions ran high, culminating in her father's physical confrontation with Marco, grabbing him by the collar and forcibly evicting him from our home. Renee pleaded with her father to stop, but the damage was done. I stood back, observing the intricate web of deceit Renee had spun, and while her parents offered apologies, I reassured them that there was no need for such gestures concerning Renee's actions. I then disclosed my intentions to file for divorce and insisted that Renee needed to vacate the premises without delay. Surprisingly, she didn't resist the notion, instead, she quietly retreated to a room to gather her belongings. However, her father's resolve was firm, he declared that she had created this mess and must now suffer the consequences. Before leaving, he made it clear to Renee that her relationship with Marco had cost her dearly, stripping away the good things she once had. Once they departed, it wasn't long before Renee left as well. She didn't look at me or say a word, she simply averted her gaze and walked away with an air of resignation. In the aftermath, I found myself torn between two conflicting emotions, a sense of satisfaction for having put her in a humiliating position and a deep sympathy for the turmoil she was experiencing. Fast forward a month, and my lawyer reached out to Renee to confirm her address for sending the divorce papers. She indicated that she would come by the office to pick them up. An hour later, my lawyer informed me that she arrived, briefly reviewed the terms, signed the documents in front of him, handed them back, and left without delay. Just a week ago, we both appeared before the magistrate to finalize the divorce. She sat alone, her demeanor reflecting the weight of her circumstances. Throughout the proceedings, she remained quiet and withdrawn, affirming her agreement with my terms when prompted. To be candid, I didn't have significant assets that would warrant a dispute over, as our living arrangement was a rental and, given her employment, there was no obligation for me to pay alimony. In fact, I decided against seeking alimony due to her infidelity and deceit. Consequently, our divorce was finalized without any contentious arguments. While some might criticize me for allowing her to walk away without a fight, I understood that she had already suffered great losses, her marriage, her family, and her self-respect had all vanished. Just yesterday, Renee's mother reached out to inquire about the status of the divorce. I informed her that it had been finalized, and she broke down in tears, expressing her deep concern about Marco potentially falling back into his pill addiction. She feared he might lead her daughter down a dangerous path filled with obsession and criminal behavior. Additionally, she mentioned that her father had removed Renee from his will, afraid she would squander his hard-earned money to fuel Marco's drug habit. I offered my sympathies urging her to take care of herself. It is truly bewildering how someone can become so blinded by love that they lose sight of everything valuable in their lives. When love becomes so intense that it drives someone to the brink of losing everything, it raises serious questions about the nature of that love. 
Take Renee, for instance. She is not just any woman, she is intelligent, sharp, and perceptive. With her capabilities, one would expect her to make wise decisions, especially concerning her relationships. Yet, despite her remarkable qualities, she chooses to get involved with Marco, a decision that seems completely irrational given the circumstances. It makes you stop and think about the choices other people make in their love lives. If someone as capable as Renee could overlook critical red flags and leap into a relationship that could jeopardize her well-being, what does that say about the rest of us? It prompts a broader reflection on how love can blind even the most rational minds, leading them to partake in situations that might ultimately bring them harm or loss. The way love can cloud judgment and create a dissonance between intellect and emotion is something many can relate to, but witnessing it in someone so astute makes it even more striking. It raises the question, how many others are out there, caught in similar circumstances, where affection overshadows common sense?